Hello, my name's Roy Jenkins. This is my political party, Gets Now It's Out, the Truck Party. It was registered in 2006 at the Electoral Commission in London. I've been campaigning since 1990 against fraud, corruption, perverting the course of justice, etc. As we see, this was a, an, an 1860, a six, 1860 note where they call the Quacker Budger was a type of a wooden politi uh, politician uh, who acted on the instructions of an influential third party. I'll just go through a few details, a few pages, I won't do many because we will be doing a longer one later, a longer video later. First of all, this is a letter that I received from the Metropolitan Police when I complained. They accused me, the Met Metropolitan uh, Commissioner accused me of not sending documents so I don't know how to prove that he'd actually received them. When you see this letter, it states, it shows quite clearly that there's no email number, no fax number, no phone number, no reference number for me to contact. It then accused me of trying to smear people's names. They did receive the parcel. They did read all the documents I'd sent in. They filed them and recorded them, but unfortunately, they'd all disappeared. When I asked for the file number or the recording number, they couldn't find that either. So this is one of the things that when we say to people, if you've had the same sort of problems, please get in touch with us because we want to get as many people together as we can to take things forward. Doing this on your own simply doesn't work. If you haven't got a lot of people together, then you're not going anywhere. But with a lot of, if I can get people to come in with us, just write to what's on, on the first page, we can put everything together. You, we need 150,000 people to sign a petition. Then by law, the House of, House of Commons has to read the paper out. So if we can all get together, we've got a good chance. Nobody's asking for money if you want to join the party or whatever. Simply send an email. This here is two tapes. In 2000, on January the 18th, 2000, I made a two taped portion statement for St uh, Canning Police Station. On that statement, I spoke about the fraud by Bradford and Bingley Bank, judges, police, etc. This, this package was opened on the 9th of March uh, 2020. So we gave it 20 years. People have asked, why do you wait 20 years? Well, it means we've been able to prove the lies that have been and the cover ups that have gone on in that time. But now we have that, those two tapes are now ready to be transcribed. And then we'll hear what actually was said. This is a judgment that was given to me by District Judge uh, Isley, in which he stated, I'd won my case against Westmoreland's police. They'd failed to, to provide any evidence. They, they raced to the court and then they claimed that it was never given to them. They never received the judgment. Well, we know they did because the court at Stafford also said they'd sent it to them. This is one of the things that they've been fighting, tax evasion. This is taken from a tape that I made of a corrupt customs officer. We also did four tapes of corrupt police officers. On this tape, it sh on this letter, it clearly shows he's saying that tax evasion is rife within the commercial sector. It also explains how these uh, false invoices are drawn up and used. I know they were, how they were being used, I was forced to use them. But that will go on next time. Okay. This part is about where I try to have uh, arrest warrants issued against chief constables and CEOs of the Bradford and Bingley. They would, I requested they be issued on the uh, 8th of August in 2010. When you read the bottom part, the only person that can deal with an arrest warrant application is a magistrate where once you put the documents in court, 
that you then have to go into the court before the magistrate and swear on oath that everything that's in the file is true. Otherwise, you're obviously in trouble if you're, if, if you're telling lies. This was a, a judgment made by a district judge, Wickham. A district judge has no right at all to deal with an arrest warrant applications. When you see the judgments, you see at the top that it says Judiciary of England and Wales. It doesn't say the City of Westminster Magistrates Court. There is no court reference number, which there has to be. There is no uh, case reference number, which has to be. And then on there, it clearly states that I wanted uh, uh, arrest warrants issued against Chief Constable Swift, Chief Constable Swift, uh, Sim, Paul Jordan, Head of Legal Services with the Bradford of Bingley, Stephen Crawshaw, CEO of the Bradford of Bingley, Richard Pym, he's uh, CEO of the Bradford and Bingley, and Alistair Darling, who is the uh, Minister for the Finance. On the back page, again, that's of a judgment, signs it as Daphne Wickham, as a, she's a district judge. No, uh, we have letters from the court saying the only people that can actually deal with an arrest warrant is the City of Westminster Magistrates Court. This is a, an email I received from Mr Justice Bean. I made an application for an appeal and on this, this appeal he's written this is a vexatious judi judicial review claim as I've ever seen. Well we did write him a, a polite letter three pages long asking him to explain where I've been vexatious, which he refuses to reply to, uh, which was, we knew that was, that he wasn't going to do that. This is a letter to Staffordshire Police Force. In this letter, I'd asked them to provide me with the case number and the court number for the arrest warrant application I made. This, the, the paperwork was sent to their barrister what they say in, in here, no such number exists at Staffordshire Police Force of a case number or a reference number to the hearing. So it was just, somebody did it, throw it out and, and bamboozle him. Okay, for people who've lost their homes, this is what, these, this is what we were fighting about earlier. This here is a page from Lord Justice Ward's judgment when I appeared before him. He says that he says at the top, he cannot he cannot understand costs of fifteen to sixteen thousand pounds for the simple hearing. But they had they did go up more after that. Also we provided Lord Justice Ward with paperwork showing that though the Bradford and Bingley and their barrister had claimed in court that the day before the hearing in two, uh, May of two thousand they recredited to my account two sums of money. Lord Justice Ward mentions in it, mention, mentions it here, a total sum of £1,361.18 has been credited to Jenkins account and that the further sum of £1,488 has been credited to the account on the day before the hearing, before the district judge. And then on paragraph 32, Lord Justice Ward says, these figures do not appear on official communications from the building society placed before me and that is a matter which needs to be investigated. He referred me to the Ombudsman or to the police. Unfortunately, the Ombudsman has lost all the paperwork, not once but twice. The police say it's not a police matter, yet it is. If somebody signs a false statement of truth and enters them into court, they, they, they can go to jail for up to 10 years at a time. We were ordered to pay, and we were told we had arrears of nearly £5,000. We contacted the official uh, building society's ombudsman, Mr Murphy. At the bottom, he confirms uh, that he found the building society 
was guilty of maladministration. But the thing that we found out that was amazing about it, the person that sits on Mr Murphy's panel and also on the new uh, uh, financial ombudsman is a Mr McGuinness. Mr McGuinness is the General Secretary of the Bradford and Bingley and he advises Mr Murphy and the other gentleman, the new ombudsman, how to do, deal with complaints about his own building society. It's completely against the rules of the, the financial ombudsman, but rules don't count when you're talking banks. They count for nothing. So if you've lost your own, we understand that there's over three million homes being repossessed. And when we come out of this virus 19, the banks are already hiding hundreds of bailiffs ready to start snatching back homes, flats, whatever. This was drew up, drawn up by a, an accountant. And the Brett oh, we were showing in a second, but he's showing that 1997, our, our credit was 193. 98, 31 pound arrears. 99, credit of 81 pound when I read the, the uh, statement of truth made by Paul Jordan, who was the head of legal services for the Bradford and Bingley, that's the date, that's his signature. When we're talking about these documents, if you're in a civil court, they would say the time is up. But documents that have knowingly been signed that are false to gain uh, money by fraudulent means, it's a criminal act. Criminal acts don't have any time limits. But this is what you see, Bradford and Bing R. Jenkins versus Bradford and Bingley. When I go on to the second page, you'll have to excuse me that I've done this before, so when we go on already. Now here it is paragraph four. This is part of uh, Paul Jordan, Head of Legal Services for the Bradford and Bingley, he signed his statement of truth. And he says, uh, even if such monies were refunded to the claimants, there would still be substantial arrears of payments. We found out from various, right into various building societies, that when they talk about substantial arrears, they start at £8,000 upwards. So, the day he made this statement and signed this statement of truth and entered it into Stafford Court, he's telling the court we had substantial arrears from £8,000 plus. When we spoke to the judge, I won't say too much about the judge because he, I don't want it to matter too much. This is a letter that I received from Paul Jordan after the hearing. And he states quite clearly, I can. I can confirm for the avoidance of doubt that on the 31st of October 1999 your arrears balance stood at £51.89 in arrears. So a bit different to £8,000 to £10,000 which he claimed in his statement of truth that we had. But the other thing, if people who have lost homes, if you, this is going back before 2000, but if you, if you can still find your statements, your mortgage, your mortgage statements, if you look on there, at the bottom it will say additional interest. And that additional interest is a fine. It's not interest, they're fining you. So if you have missed a week, have missed a payment by a week, they will fine you for doing that. We've got several of these. I mean, there's too many to, uh, to go, on, go on with for now. But again, this is what we're asking people. If you've got, if you've had these problems, just get in touch with us. We've got, we've already, we've already put in stuff forward all the time anyway. Going back to this uh, £51.89, pound, I actually found the finance uh, units at the Bradford and Bingley, and I was asking him, can you tell me what this inter additional interest means? And then he just burst out laughing. And I asked him, no, tell, tell me what the additional interest means in financial terms. What is it for? 
and then they explain the same thing. If you're doing arrears of any sort, we will charge you additional interest. Well, mine came to nearly three thousand pound over a few years. So, you, 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 if you can, if you've lost your own and you can find your own mortgage statements, go back and have a look, because they could amount to thousands of pounds. We were told in the '94, I think it was a '95, we had five thousand pounds in arrears. Now bear in mind that came, we only took the mortgage out in 92 I think it was, so in 95 suddenly we got £5,000 in arrears. Unfortunately I was out of the country because I drove all around Europe. My father-in-law went to Bradford and Bingley and paid the amount and from that day to this day Bradford and Bingley simply refused to send any documentation showing where we had £5,000 arrears. But they refused to return the money they claimed in the phone that when they, they paid two sums of money back to my account on the 4th of May 2000, uh, 1999, that was the day before the actual hearing on May the 5th. They also claimed they backdated one, of the money, uh, one sum of the money back to December 1999 and they paid another sum of or just under £1,400. On the 4th of May, the day before the hearing, none of those sums of money have appeared on any of our statements, our year-end mortgage statements from 1999 up until we paid the mortgage off. HHJ Rubery actually ordered the Bradford and Bingley, this is his court order, which he issued on, in uh, Stoke-on-Trent County Court, uh, read the appeal. The bundle is to be agreed between Mr Jenkins and the Bradford and Bingley and to be paginated and forwarded to the judge, uh, the evidence of the two transactions to my account in the days that, and the months they mentioned. I, Bradford and Bingley received that, they just simply refused to reply. When I got to court, I pointed out to, I wanted the, the hearing to be held under oath which he wouldn't allow. Uh, Ruby wouldn't allow that. Uh, same when I appeared before HHJ uh, Perrit. They came out with the same. We, I've been to the police, I've given them all the evidence. We've been to the uh, corporation fraud uh, unit of the police. They claim they went to the Bradford and Bingley. They were shown the financial record showing these two credits have been made to our account. Yes, when we asked under the Freedom of Information Act for the police to provide us with the information showing they'd been to the Bradford and Bingley and confirming in writing that they'd seen these transactions, they simply refused to reply to them. When I went to the police, uh, this is in 2005, uh, the Chief Constable of his Chief Inspector states, A, the making of a full statement of truth by Mr Jordan of the Bradford and Bingley Building Society, in my opinion, the documentation does not provide su sufficient evidence to support any criminal uh, proceedings against Mr Jordan. Well, I'll show you later documents which show that there are court orders, court laws. He should have been dealt with, he should have been charged because he admitted in the one letter I read out that actually we did have a substantial arrears on the day he signed his statement of the truth. We only had arrears of £51 plus. His excuse was, when he wrote a letter, he said that he didn't write the, the statement of truth. One of his staff wrote the statement of truth and he simply signed it. Well, I've been told by judges, if you sign something without reading the small print, then it's your problem. It doesn't belong to anybody else. If you signed it, as Jordan did, then he signed, knowingly signed a false documentation, false statement of truth, which can carry a jail sentence up to 10 years, which will explain why we can't get, we've never been able to get proper justice from the police or uh, Prime Minister, anyone. Yeah, as I say, I've read out the, um, these are the, Mortgage, you have any mortgage statements which shows what the additional interest is. 
uh, when I found their financial office or legal office, they just laughed, laughed at me when I asked, what does an additional interest mean? And eventually he told me, it's fining. If you miss a week or you're a week late, they can fine you for being a week late. They don't even have to say, they do now. They changed the law in 2000. I wrote to several mortgage companies and I asked them all, what do you consider to be substantial arrears? Everyone comes up with the same version. Eight, 10,000 pounds is the normal. So if you've if you got £8,000 of this, you're in substantial areas. But everywhere we've gone, it's done when it's the police, the building society's ombudsman, the financial ombudsman. We've been uh, to police, judges. Judges have the right. When I asked Lord Justice Ward, I said, will you bring the police in? Because I, t I explained to him and gave him paperwork and the problems we were having with the police. And he said he, could, he wasn't allowed to do it. But later in his judgment, he actually says a judge is allowed to bring in the police if he thinks criminal acts have been committed. Because, as we, as we found out over the years, a lot of judges have money in, uh, or shares in building societies, banks. They're not going to go against their own. But I'd like to, just so we get everything right, everything I say, and everything that uh, everything I produce is there. It's it isn't just my words. It's the words of the people that send me letters. So if we ask a question and they reply, this is we're asking them. You tell us the truth. If they've lied, we now that we've now found out how they do lie, and they lie for one another. In actual fact, I had one judge tell me in the raw courts of justice while I was waiting to go in. No judge will find another judge guilty of making a wrong decision or judgment. So, so you're beating your head against a brick wall. These things happen, believe me, we've, we've done it more than, more than once. This is a, a letter we wrote to Mr Justice Bean, to the Administrator Court Office at the Royal Courts of Justice. He called my application the most vexatious that he's seen. Well, all this is a polite letter. There's no word in there that we said anything wrong. We've asked him simply to give us, uh, in there we've asked for statutes, laws, uh, and uh, to show a judge is allowed to enter into secret uh, conversation with the defendants without actually intending us a copy. District Judge w uh, Wickham wrote to all, wrote to the Bradford and Bingley, they wrote to the, judge, the CEOs, they wrote to the police. No records of her letters exist anywhere, as I've said in, in the letter, earlier letter, they were received from Stafford Police. They confirmed quite categorically, we have no case number and we have no case reference number for the court hearing before Wickham. And funny enough, I've just been looking there this morning and I've, that was when I suddenly realised that Judge Wickham hasn't used uh, City of Westminster paper, magistrate court paper. It's like a John Bull sit. It's, it looks to me, it's not a, not a proper court paper, which is what we're bringing up now. Um, through the years, as I say, we, we've tried many, many times. I don't think that anywhere we haven't been. I went to the Bar Council and the Bar Council rolled back and they stated there's obviously something very wrong but the, the uh, barrister, Mr Jackson, who acted for the Bradford and Bingley could only put to a judge what the Bradford and Bingley solicitors had given him. So when I said they'd lied in, the, in their paperwork to the barrister, the Bar Council didn't argue. But they say we can only deal uh, with the barrister and we can't find against the barrister because he's been given the paperwork by the uh, solicitor for the Bradford and Bingley who's researched it and handed it to him. So when he was in court before Rubri uh, in 2005, I said to Rubri, you issued a court order that they were to provide the copies of 
off, off their financial records showing that they had repaid this, these two credits to our account. And you look at, I held the documents up, I've just held there, and all Ruby did went, I don't want to talk about that now. That's in, his, that's in his judgment we've got there, but he doesn't want to talk about it. He's not going there. Not going down that road again was his, was his words. So he, when you go before it, the other thing that you find, which we found, we were litigants in person. When we first went to court in 1999, I was a litigant in person. So I'd gone to the court and I'd asked them to explain exactly what I needed to do. They gave me the forms. In the forms it states, seven days before the hearing date, everything you want to use in court, you must provide the judge with and the other side with. Otherwise, it can't be heard. Well, when we walked into court before District Judge Isley, the Bradford and Bingley, the solicitors and the barrister, as we entered into the court and sat down, he gave me a brown folder and he said, read this. We found out later what should have happened. When he gave the copies to uh, District Judge uh, Isley, she should have asked us, as we wouldn't know, or we didn't know, do you want these documents to be allowed to be heard? Do you want a recession so we, you can read the documents? Or if you don't want them at all, you don't have to, you don't have to allow them to be entered. Well, we said we didn't want them to be allowed to be entered, but they just, that went by. When she opened her, her envelope, inside was 32 pages. And all I worked with 32 pages of figures, one after the other. We had no chance of ever even looking at it. We wouldn't know what they were. It would have taken us, taken us weeks to try to find out. But we've kept the documents, so we have all the documents as evidence. But then we found out afterwards the judge was obliged by law to ask us the very same question. Do you want them entered? Do you want them refused? Do you want to uh, cancel your in for today? I said, no, we didn't want them being entered, but it didn't make any difference. Then, if it seems complicated, it's not that complicated, it's just going. We, we were, I made an appeal to Stafford Court, and it was an appellant's hearing. So the only person that could be there was me. The other side could be there, but they couldn't say anything or do anything. It was on, strictly on what I put forward, what I asked the judge, what the judge asked me. Funny enough, it was HAJ Rubri. The day before this hearing, I received a message from Stafford Court telling me that my hearing had been adjourned. I asked why, why has it been adjourned? I haven't adjourned it. Oh no, the Bradford and Bingley wrote to the judge asking it be adjourned because they hadn't had time to put their paperwork in. As I just explained, Stuck the court explaining letters, it's your paperwork and your paperwork only. Not only did Bradford and Bingley apply for and get from Rubri an adjournment, they put in costs for £4,000 for the hearing they couldn't even be at. So they couldn't claim costs for my hearing. But the judge, when I explained it to the judge later, they just shrug it off like well, those things happen. Uh, when we appeared before H.A. Jubilee the last time, uh, I was querying the cost and uh, Rubri picked the costs up from the Bradford and Bingley and that suddenly said to them, why are you charging London costs for solicitors and barristers for the Staffordshire court? It's not that you can't do that. There's two sets of each courts varying in court as different uh, costs that you can claim. So we did all to that. Uh, they didn't repossess the heirs. Judge, I, I told Judge Rubri that I was going forward. I was going to the Royal Courts of Justice. So he just turned around and said, uh, put it up for sale. When it's sold, sort out the costs. But what you've got to do, that's it. That was when we went before Lord Justice Ward. Uh, when I, I appealed, I was put before uh, Lord Justice 
uh, Richards and Mr Justice, Justice Madison at the uh, court in London. I got, got to the court at five, five past two, when I entered the court, five past two, and as they were talking, I realised they were just, they were uh, giving me wrong dates, wrong, and the Madison was looking over and then he wanted to know what I was writing. And I said, well, you're giving me wrong dates, you're giving me wrong years, who said what, all that's wrong. They both stood up, went to the chambers, they were in there for four or five minutes, came back out, they got a several page judgment, which they read out, telling me why I was wrong, and the, and the Bradford Bigley was right. And then they got up, walked out the court, that was 25 past two. So in 20 minutes, all that had been done. The judgment had been written before they got into court. It was there waiting. All they needed to do was walk in the chambers, come back out, there's a paper. Again, all the, all the judgments, they, when they give you a judgment, such as Madison and Richards did, they put the time you went to court and the time you leave court. So when I say I went into five past two and I was back out to 25 past two, it's there on record. Nobody can say, well, they couldn't have done it that quick. My hearing wasn't to be heard. It was as simple as that. They didn't want it to be heard, which is why they wanted to cover up for District Judge Wickham. Uh, again, I'll explain. Judge, district judges are not allowed to deal with uh, matters of arrest, arrest warrant appeals. The only person who can do that is an actual magistrate. But District Judge Wickham was sent to Bradford to do with the judge and his wife, who had both admitted they perverted the course of justice, which is a serious offence. When Wickham got there, he slapped them both on the wrist and then told them, don't do it again. Then she was given a job on the Immigration Appeals panel by Cameron, which was a nice little learner for her, and she was out of the court. When Cameron, when we, I've written to Cameron several times. If you look, go to Google or whichever, look through the records. When they were closing the Bradford and Bingley down, because they were causing, there was so much financial uh, corruption, I believe it was between 500 and 800 million pounds of shareholders' money vanished. Nobody could find it. Cameron appointed Mr. Richard Banks to be the person to deal with the uh, shareholders. And I, if I remember right, he offered something like 10 pence in the pound. So people who've saved all their life for the pension, just lost everything. And then Richards went from being the person dealing with the uh, shareholders. He was made the CEO of the Bradford and Bingley by Cameron. And then he was, he was on, I think it was 1.8 million a year, plus expenses and a golden handshake. So I would ask anybody that's had these problems with building societies, or you feel your home's been repossessed illegally, please get in touch on the number on the, on the post, poster uh, so we can go forward. I have already written to Bra uh, Boris Johnson since November, sending him various documents and asking him why he hasn't acted all that the, the Prime Minister before haven't acted. They are criminal acts. They know exactly what they've done. When they've signed false papers, they know they've signed full, false papers and they've used them in court, which they know is illegal. It's taken me a long time to find the various laws out simply because nobody wants to tell you. If you ask under the Freedom of Information Act, there's always some vague reply. The police haven't been at any help whatsoever, but I was informed that allegedly, I will say allegedly, I haven't seen it with my own eyes. But certain police officers are allowed to buy homes that have been repossessed by building societies at a fraction of the value that they actually are. I can only assume this, again, is allegedly that the police turn a blind eye. I know from my own paperwork here, the police do turn a blind eye. They don't want those questions. They don't want to arrest anyone with anything to do 
with the building society or the bank. If you look in Iceland, I can't remember the exact amount, they arrested loads of bankers. They arrested them, they jailed them, repossessed all their assets, and that they banned them from working at banks again. They've done the same in Spain, they've done the same in Germany, as I understand. In England, if you complain about a banker and that he's committed fraud, our government knights them. They just say, oh, hang on, Fred the Shred, who was with the Royal Bank of Scotland, he was knighted. And look at the billions of pounds that were lost by the, the Bank of Scotland. Okay, this is a part uh, dealing with the DWP. Uh, most people know with the pension companies, elderly people are treated uh, horribly. This was an article written by Campbell uh, Cameron just before the general election of 2010, and he's talking about the Tories, and he says, we will always look after the needy, the disadvantaged, the elderly, the frail, and the poorest of our country. That is the sort of person I am, David Cameron. Well, if you go through his record in dealing with pensions and people on uh, benefits, it's worse than a third world country, the way he's dealt with it. This is a, a court case that I attended for an elderly relative um, at Warsaw Courts. The DWP at Litchfield had been to a house and they told her they were taking away parts of a pension or parts of a benefits. Then they, they said they wanted to destroy every, every letter they'd ever sent her. There was approximately an 80 page statement that uh, Duncan Smith's crew issued to Warsaw Courts. Uh, they accused this 90 year old woman of moving in a new partner after her husband had died. They accused her of deliberately defrauding the state uh, and hiding documents that she shouldn't have hid. We got to the court on the 20th of December 2012. I was asked by the usher, do you have any further documents? And I said, yes, I've got a copy of a letter from 2006. I gave a copy for the judge and I gave a copy for the solicitors, barristers, for the DWP. Now the DWP and Duncan Smith had said these letters that I was presenting simply didn't exist. Nobody knew anything about it. So I handed the, the doc at these letters to the DW, uh, the usher. She gave one to the de judge's chambers and she handed one to the barristers, solicitors of the DWP. After several minutes of looking at the DWP actually ran out of the court because everything they put in their statement of truth was shown to be nothing but a pack of lies. The judge found for this relative and he said even if the DWP comes back again he will throw that, that claim out as well. It wouldn't be heard in his court again. These are our people that are old age because like with a lot of old age pensioners, we don't really understand what goes on. So if it comes some money or they take some of it, you don't really know what they're doing and they don't really explain it to you. This recently was a letter from Stafford Council, Staffordshire Council. In this letter, they're threatening this relative who is now not, she's 98 this year or was. They're telling her here that if she doesn't contact them, them within the next seven days to say how she's going to pay these bills that she owes, they're going to send in the bailiffs to repossess any possessions here. You will be able to read this on, on the site later, but that's what they say. I now advise, have to advise you that unless payment is received within the next seven days, or you contact us to discuss this issue, proceedings to recover this debt will commence and will include legal action. One of the bills was of £441 for home care. Bear in mind, she's 98. She was 98 years old. This finished it all. One of the things helped to finish it all. Um, she was 98. She's registered blind and she couldn't hear properly. And they come in and said, 
she owed three bills. So when I contact, I contacted the, the uh, Staffordshire Council. They accused me of shouting when I wasn't. I was just asking questions I wanted answering. Then I said, then I said hang on, when was this money owed from? And they said November 2019 to January or February of 2019. So I, I checked while she was talking, I checked the records and she'd actually been in hospital for those three months. She wasn't at the home, she wasn't at home, she wasn't at the home care place. Uh, then it sort of, uh, when I said I want proof of what you're saying, she doesn't know this money, I think it was just under £700. Then they went away. When they came back, this was in January this year, or February this year, they came back and said we're sorry. When we sent the letter out, the address we sent it to, the gentleman there sent it straight back to us in November telling us that no one of that name lived there and who also sent the letter back to the council that they sent there. And they never do anything till, they, till we got this letter in uh, 29th of January 2020. So when we were talking, then it, then it turns out she didn't owe the money. But if we hadn't have been there to protect her, then she would have paid. She, she, didn't, she was the sort of person that didn't like owing money. So if a bill come in today, which was not to repay for another two months, she would pay to get it out of the way. We've been told that she was she overpaid £4,000 at the home. We don't know for sure yet because the home said one thing, Stafford Council have said another. But this is happening to your parents, to your grandparents. They're getting these letters, they're being fleeced, they're being robbed, and they, can't, they don't know that they are being robbed. We've had several people come on saying their parent, the one woman was away on holiday. When she came back, there's a seat, there are secret courts throughout the UK that can only be used by the DWP, the pension service, or the NHS, or, or like Staffordshire Council. They can go to that court, they can tell the judge the person has got dementia or you're too ill or whatever. They can take the home, they can take all the money they've got in the bank, they can sell all the furniture, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. The only way we found out about it was a woman came home from her holiday, went to see a uh, mother. When she got there, all the doors were locked, all the furniture had gone, and all the money in the bank had gone. Luckily, she was, um, uh, uh, what'd you, you sign a document where you can act for your parents and they can't uh, uh, dispute it, so if it's, uh, I can't remember the name, but anyway, we signed one of those, so we, we knew that they couldn't take the money off her or do anything. But this is how they, uh, they abuse the system. When we went to court and we were asking, well, why have they said, why did they come and tell us that she owed £3,000? When they came into the house to see her, the chap, it was just like getting the Gestapo or the KGB, he sat down at the table and he didn't say words of what was going on. He just said, you have been overpaid by nearly uh, £3,000. We want the £3,000 back. If you haven't got a cheque to give me, I will stay here in the house while you go to the bank, collect the £3,000 and bring it back here. He was told to clear it off, told to go away. It, she was, she didn't know it, and she wasn't it wasn't going to pay. That's when this district judge Barry at Walsall Court, he just dismissed their claim completely. They filled in false statements of truth. They used false figures, and it's all come from the top, which was Duncan Smith, who was the minister for the DWP. I've sent letters to uh, this was a letter to the tribunal uh, at Walsall at Birmingham asking for documents of proof. They refuse to send them. They tell me they don't exist. This is a letter from Burnley uh, Pension Service. As promised, please find enclosed responses to Mike Taylor and Pat Moore. Unfortunately, Mike cannot re recall anything about his visit, but surprisingly, Pat remembers the visits she made in 2007. Now this Mike was the one that demanded payment, he wanted the cash and he was going to wait to get the cash. 
until he was politely told to leave. Again, when you come back to all the, all the people who don't, this is an email that I received from the Burnley uh, Pension Services. This was written by Pat Moore, the, the, the lady that came out. Her words were, I remember this family very, very well. I don't recall having much, much to do with Mrs. Lemaitre. My first meeting may have been about appointee. What I remember clearly is that the son-in-law and his wife had had many problems with all sorts of organisations, including their building society and the pension service. They were very open about everything and I was aware that they were living with your customer after losing their eyes. Well, we didn't lose it. We were ordered to sell it. We did not distinguish ourselves. I took much evidence about capital and expenditure. The pension service lost the documents more than once. So I visited several times. The son-in-law made a complaint against the department alleging everybody had his in for him. He had uh, maintained that I had powers. He meant the government were against him. Well, what I was against was the fact they came to my house, they took all the documents they asked for, because of problems I've had in the past with the likes of Bradford and Bingham police, judges, I contacted the DWP in Lichfield and said, I would like you to send somebody out. So every document we fill in is filled in properly and can't be said later that we filled it in wrong or we try to, to defraud them. Uh, obviously, when she first came, when Mrs. Moore first came, she took a statement from me that she signed and I signed. She took all the original documentation, bank statements, whatever, wouldn't accept any copies at all. They lost them six weeks later. She came back, took the same stuff again. Then they came back again and she said, we've lost those as well. Well, that time I'd had enough and I said, go away, I'll, go, I'll get in touch with Duncan Smith, etc. as if that was going to do me any good. But... You think these people are honest, they ain't honest, they don't care about you. This is a letter I sent to Duncan Smith, who was a pensions minister. I sent it to his uh, constituency office. I gave him the court number, uh, court number, case number, whatever, and I asked him in the letter, do you get pleasure from terrorising 92-year-olds with court threats? Your legal office use false statements of truth and deliberately withheld documentation requested from your Litchfield office. Every time we, could, we contacted your Litchfield office, they came back with the excuse, we can't find them on our computer records, we can't find them on our paper records. This is, this is a normal thing. I have, I don't know, 50, 100 letters from various forces and government offices. Whenever you ask for a document, we've lost them. We can't find them. With they don't exist, uh, then I'll get called Mr. Vexatious. That's the favourite name. Uh, that This is the second one to Duncan Smith. Um, but I've asked him again why, uh, when the judge threw out his application, and I've asked for the documentation, and it says uh, 100,000 people died in a year. I believe the figure is through ATOS actions. That was the one that was investigating before the day before. Smith come into it, but it, it, all the, all these uh, authorities are all based on the same thing. If they get caught out, they'll simply lie about it. They won't tell you the truth about it. They just come come up with the words. Oh, we can't find it. Yeah, uh, can't find the documents. I've had it happen with uh, the Met Commissioner, Soccer, uh, Number Ten, Police, uh, Chief Constables. The list goes on and on. We've lost them, and yet I've had I've had a lot of honest police officers help me out over the years. They call them all corrupt. They're not all corrupt. There's a lot of good police officers about, and some have come to me and so when I've been struggling to find something out, they have come along and just it's like a whisper in the ear. Look in this area. That's where you'll find what you're looking for. I, I sent documents to Blair when he was first uh, my prime minister sent him all the documents of the fraud, the corruption that was going on. And they wrote back to say, or his, his office wrote back to say, they've been passed to the appropriate office. But if you're talking about police corruption or solicitors or bankers corruption, you go to the obvious uh, 
ministries. Mine was sent to the Lord Chancellor's office and the office told judges where they'd be sitting for the next six months. And the, the documents have been there for two years. Every time I rode to Blair's office, uh, number 10, all Blair said was they were the appropriate office. Uh, the personal private secretary to the, the Lord Chancellor was my MP, Dr Tony Wright. And the documents I were giving him, he claimed was passed to Tony Wright, who passed them back to where Tony Wright was working. So it was a covered up. When I asked, we eventually found the documents and I wrote a letter to the Lord Chancellor's office and they came back and said, we don't know why Tony Blair, MP, a PM, sent these documents to us. They're nothing to do with us. But they'd left them sitting in a drawer for two years, gathered in dust, until I actually found out from an honest person where they were. So whatever I say or whatever I say about the police, I don't include them all. There are lots of good police officers and there's a lot of good police officers that have actually helped me out and, explain, and customs officers have come forward and said, you're going about that the wrong way to find that, you're going about it the wrong way. They won't give you that, but go this way. When I contacted um, the parliamentary ombudsman, Mrs. Abrams, the only way you can contact is you've got to go through your own MP. Well, at that time, I didn't know Tony Wright was covering up for the police and, uh, and for Blair. So that only came about when I found out years later he was the person private uh, secretary to the Lord Chancellor. So don't, don't, please don't put every poor police officers or customs officers in the same uh, boat as the corrupt ones. But Mrs. Abraham, um, when she set me the file back about that thing, all the documentation, all the tapes and the records, they were just redacted. So you would see uh, two R Jenkins, but then everything else was all black where everything had been redacted. That went on page after page. So every time I wrote back and said, this doesn't tell me anything, all you show me here is just black ink all over everything. We're not allowed for you to have it. But under the Freedom of Information Office, you're supposed to give it, mate. Back they come again. Uh, under this, it's uh, against the security system. So we can't give you. So who are you covering up for? You're not covering up for me. You're obviously covering up for something else. All I'm asking people is come on board with us, because it, at the end of the end of the day, we need really to get justice for everybody. We're getting people who are on pensions, losing pensions, losing money, hundreds of thousands of deaths. I think it's 140,000 deaths now with a pension, uh, 60 odd suicide caused by uh, Duncan Wright's DWP. We've got people being killed in hospital. Pension is not being looked after. They've been ripped off left, right and centre because people are going inside. They can't look after themselves. They haven't been at home. And when they took, I mean, home prices now, where my relative was, it was like £700 a month. That was £700 or £800 a month. So the, the money doesn't go down it doesn't last very long at all. All they kept asking, they kept asking her to sign a form and they were asked, they wanted to know, do you own your own, own home? Is it paid for? How much savings have you got? Or is it in your name? And then once you sign the document, once you'd sign the document, they could go to what they want, excuse me, they wanted to do it. And there was nothing she could do about it. But I do ask you to come on board any of the things we're talking about, all of this stuff is being put on the web page. Uh, there is some on there now, but I haven't put on any stuff on for a couple of years because I've simply been struggling trying to get information. They just will not give me the information that I want. Uh, I've tried through the Ministry of the uh, Freedom of Information offered in Ch uh, Cheshire, get told the same thing. You can't get any off. A Prime Minister, you can, all your uh, MPs now don't have to answer any freedom of information. Write to the police, they'll tell you, no, you can't have it because it's uh, secrecy or whatever it may be. But this will also be going on on the, the, the side. 
These are in his R versus West London Justice ex, ex parte plan. These are rules and regulations. Now they're telling you a person to be to be treated for the purpose is the part of make as making a false instrument. If he alters an instrument as to make it in false in any any respect, whether or not it is false in some other respect, apart from alteration. So if they make a statement of truth which is false, they can go to jail for up to ten years. Making a genuine instrument false, which is I've said, they've made the false statements of truth, which is a criminal act. They go on about forgery. They give you the acts, but you've been, I mean, it's too long to do now. But I'll put that will be put on the side. This one is just page of the. It's called the um, EM five one hundred six dash penalties culpability. Halsbury's Laws of England fraud, and again it quotes there seven five seven. What constitutes fraud? Making a false statement of truth enter it into court to gain an illegal uh, judgment. So with us, as I say, with what I'm doing now, I've, I've opened it up more now because I have got further information which has been denied to me for several years. Now we've got it. I've got the tapes. Uh, the, obviously, they did nobody realise we kept the tape for 20 years. And the reason we kept it for 20 years without opening, opening the envelope they were in or listening to them, we could collect all the lies that they've told us over the years. When I get letters from the police, etc., they always address me as vexatious. I've got letters from the courts, Royal Courts of Justice, City, uh, Westminster Magistrate Court, I'm vexatious. But you ask the question, well, please show me where I'm vexatious. No one can. You just ask for the truth. I asked the Chief Constable of Staffordshire Police and West Midlands Police, I end all my letters to you, and I've done for several years, as a statement of truth, which are sign and date, which means if I put anything in that letter that's false, as I was told by a police officer, your feet won't touch the floor on the way to jail. So we can be charged, you get a small family, got no money for food, they steal a loaf of bread, they go to jail, they get prosecuted. Our politicians go out there and they claim public money like it's their own. Six thousand pounds have a, have a moat cleaned and they use it as their own funding, but they don't go to jail. They just get a sell off, forgot, I put it down wrong. No, they don't forget, they know exactly what they're doing. Now's the time to get rid of them now before they get so much of a hand on what we're doing. We won't have a life whatsoever. I'm doing this for my kids and my grandkids. For me, I'm too old to care. It doesn't matter to me. It ain't going to matter to me what happens now. But I do care passionately about this country and what's going on it and what we're leaving for the future generations. I do hope you've contact us. The letter, the, the email and the, everything's there. Thanks for your time. Hope to hear from you. Thank you.